are ready to start song service. If everyone could come in and take a seat, we'll start praising God together with our opening song, Anywhere with Jesus. So if we could all come in and start singing together. Our second song will be To God Be the Glory. Thank you. 
next song, we're going to be singing We Are Still Here. Next song shall be tell me the story of Jesus. Please stand.
can all be seated. Happy Sabbath. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to welcome our parents and our grandparents and many other visitors to our church service this morning. Um, let's begin our divine service with a word of prayer together. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this Sabbath morning. We thank you for your promise to be with us. And Lord, as we come to you today, we want your Holy Spirit to touch each one of our hearts. And we want to worship you, Lord, with our whole hearts. And we just pray that you would take this service, that you would bless it, and that it could be an honor to you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. What a blessing to be in the house of the Lord today. This morning, our offering is for something that only comes around once a year. It's called the Annual Sacrifice for Global Mission. And so to better explain that, we have a little video. If you could make a difference in someone's life by giving something up for one week, what would you give up? Some 100 years ago, in 1922, Seventh-day Adventists did exactly that. The money used to support missionaries was running out. When the church was nearly forced to call its missionaries home, Adventists stepped up. They accepted the challenge of the mission offering. They gave up something for mission. Children gave their piggy bank savings. Adults gave a week's wages. By giving something up, they kept the missionaries in the field. By giving something up, they kept the church's mission program on track. The annual sacrifice offering helps Global Mission start new groups of believers among unreached people, often in the most challenging places in the world. So challenging, in fact, that Global Mission identifies some of these places only as veiled cities or veiled countries. We do not publicly name these places. Today, there are still more than 7,000 unreached people groups with a total of more than 3 billion people. Jesus told the parable of the lost sheep. When one sheep was missing, the shepherd went out to search for it. We are told that when Jesus looked at the crowds, he looked at them with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Today, he still looks at the crowds with compassion. How about us? Can we look out with the same compassion? So what would you give up? That snack from the vending machine, that drink you love, a pizza, those new shoes, that new game, your favorite candy bar, that new toy, that slice of cake, hot chocolate or cold chocolate, those in-app purchases, that nearly irresistible deal of the day. Now, here's the challenge. Let's actually do it. Give up one thing for one week, challenge your friends and family, and give the money to the annual sacrifice offering. You can give online or in church. Simply mark your tithe envelope, annual sacrifice offering. What are you willing to give up for mission work? This strikes close to my heart because my parents are in mission work. May the deacons please come forward. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we can give up just a little bit of what you have given us. Please bless the offering that we have today. Please multiply it and use it in the best possible way. We thank you in Jesus' name.
Now time for a children's story. All the children can come up. Good morning, happy Sabbath. <clears throat> Today I'm gonna be telling you guys a story about when I was around nine, 10 years old. So it was Christmas and we were spending time in our grandparents' house. So we had all of our family there. We had uncles and aunts and I had all my cousins and we were about the same age. So we were just playing together and just having a great time. But one thing my grandfather told me when we got to his house was that one of the bathrooms in the house had a very hard lock, so we were to use the other bathroom because this one was very hard to unlock and he didn't want to have anyone get, getting stuck in there. So we're just playing and we didn't really pay attention to what he said and one of my cousins decided she needed to go to the bathroom. And she got there and I started to notice that she was missing, so I went around looking for her, I was like, where did she go? And as I'm going around the house, I hear some banging on the door and some screaming for help. I'm like, oh, that must be my cousin. So I was like, is that you? Are you in there? And she was like almost crying and screaming, I'm stuck, I can't get out, help. So I'm like, okay, just calm down for a second. And there was so much noise going on inside the house. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna go outside and we're gonna talk through the window. So I walk all outside the house, all around, and I get to the window and luckily it was open. So um, I start talking to her and it's like, what's going on? And she's like, I can't get out, it's locked and I can't open the lock. I'm like, okay, let's just calm down for a second. I'm gonna go back inside the house, I'm gonna pray with you and I'm gonna count to 10. I don't know why I said 10, it was just random. I could have said any other number, but I just said 10. So I go back inside and we each kneel in one side of the door. So I start praying, dear Jesus, thank you so much for Christmas and thank you so much for family. I just pray that you help my cousin to be able to open the door and come out and play with us. And then I start counting. One, two, three. And as soon as I reached 10, she was able to open the door and I could just see this look of, she looked so terrified, but she looked so relieved. And we were so thankful looking at each other in like disbelief that we couldn't believe what just had happened. And then we went about playing our day, playing um, with our other cousins during the day. And a couple minutes later, I was like, let me go back and check to see if the door was actually unlocked. So I go back and I try um, twisting the doorknob and sure enough, the door was still locked. God had opened the door for my cousin to be able to get out of the bathroom. And what I want you guys to learn from this is that God cares about the little things and no matter where you are or how old you are, God will always listen to you and listen to your prayers. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day and thank you for this Sabbath. I pray that you help us to trust in you and to know that we can come to you with every need that we have. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can go back to your seats now. It's now time for prayer and praise. This morning, I'm really thankful for friends and just good talks with people. What about you? I'm really thankful Shalena's here today. It's really good to see her smiling face. So, oh, oh, so if you guys have any praises or prayers, just raise your hand and someone will come with you. To you. I, had to I had to decide this morning whether I wanted to embarrass myself or praise the Lord, and uh, I'm deciding to praise the Lord. Andrew and I uh, were in my truck on Sunday, and some of you have heard this story, but um, I backed up in a straight line, and I should have backed up in a curve, and there was fresh snow on the ground, and it was one of those situations where you have what people call a freak accident, and the wheel of my truck got over the edge, and I, Andrew and I did a complete roll in my truck, landed back on the tires, um, little harm to us, 
moderate harm to the truck, but I'm praising the Lord that we were safe. Um, so that's, that's one praise. Um, the second thing is, you know, God's great in the big things and the small things. Yesterday, uh, James and I were working on getting the overprinting done for the concert flyers that are being handed out, and the printer was causing a problem. Some of you that print stuff now and again, you know what that's like, but we had images that were being created backwards and seemingly upside down, and then the printer was jamming after two or three pieces, and uh, we just paused and had a prayer, and God answered. We were having jam after jam, and then all of a sudden, the printer started working. What's interesting, if you've done a big print job, you know it's like sheet after sheet, just whoosh, 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 whoosh through the printer. Well, the printer wasn't doing that. It wasn't doing a jam, but the printer would print five sheets, ten sheets, and then it would slow down for a second, and then it would start printing again. And it was like God was working with the machine to keep it all flowing through. And I was excited that, to see God answer, you know, the small prayers as well. Um, let's pray for those who are handing out flyers today and tomorrow, uh, the ministry efforts there, and also, as I usually request, pray for those who are watching our ministry content online. Thank you. Praise, I suppose two praises. One is my grandpa was able to come across the border with us. Um, the other one is that um, I was knowing, I knew that I needed to take a uh, aviation related test um, this year or before next February, whatever. And so with this trip, you know, it seemed like a good time to take it. But the hard thing is that with these kind of tests, um, you're not assigned somebody to take the test, you just have a list of you know names and contact information, and you have to find the person to do your test. And um, for me, I know it would make a big difference who I got to be my tester. So I was praying about that because I didn't know like I wanted to get the right person, you know, someone that would be personable and wouldn't be too strict, wouldn't be too like you know lenient and just let anything go. And um, when I you know I scheduled and I took the test and. It was a real blessing because God cares about those small things, and it was. It was. He was a great guy that you know did the test um, friendly, and um, he'd actually done some mission aviation stuff himself. So, um, so his te you know test went well. That was another thing that I was praying about and wasn't sure about, and that was a blessing. So, just want to praise God for those little things that He arranges. So I want to praise the Lord for safety and uh, his guidance. Uh, this last Thursday, I went down to Vancouver to take carrots down there, and I had uh, 16 stops I needed to make um, before coming back home. And even throughout all the traffic, uh, there was accidents on the road and whatnot. I, I picked up my last uh, pickup from the groceries at right at 4.30, and uh, just as they were closing, and I just praise the Lord that uh, he helped everything work out just right. Um, I just have a prayer request because um, my brother is and my mom are on a plane to Thailand right now. Um, they are, my brother's going to be there for at least a year. My mom's going to go help them, help him get settled there. He's going to be working with some of our friends there. But just pray for him because, you know, he's barely an adult. So, yeah. Well, first I want to say I'm so thankful for safety and um, God's providence in getting lots of wood off the mountain the last couple of days. Um, really good experience, beautiful weather. God blessed with finding some good trees and just then skidded down and chopped up, and now they're down here safely. So very thankful for that. Uh, last evening, Jerry and Karen and Daniel, Rasmussen, and I uh, took the opportunity to go down and, and visit our, our good friend, Dr. Charles Ha been our family doctor for years, doctor for our school here. He is just ready to head out on a, uh, been invited to um, speak 12 cities in Western Canada, across the Prairie, Prairie, Prairie province, provinces, sharing with people what he's seen in his clinic as um, vaccine injuries are increasing and coming in more and more, people are getting more and more shots. 
Um, the statistics, of course, and then the scientific data supporting what's going on. Um, sharing that <coughs> as he, he covets our prayers as they travel. As we, ha we had a precious time of sharing with him and prayer with him last night. And it, it went a little longer than we ex had hoped, and it, we were getting home you know, fairly late. And as we came along the road, um, just about 10 minutes down the road, here was a, a vehicle with someone standing beside it, lights off. So, of course, we pulled over, and, and uh, they said, uh, uh, we have a flat tire. Do you have a pump? Well, I happen to have a 12-volt pump on my, my van that I've used myself and helped me out. So we, pulled, you know, of course, pulled in behind and got their tire aired up. As we put air in it, the, the hole happened to be right on top, and it was obviously a slit, and it wasn't going to, the, the, yeah, it, yeah, it needed to be changed. There, just, there was no, no simple solution, roadside solution for this. So we invited them back to our shop here. So I don't know, go close to midnight probably. <laughs> we, I don't know if anybody saw lights on down there, vehicles driving around. But anyway, um, thankfully, Daniel Rasmussen was along, and he has um, experience on the tire machine. And uh, in the province of God, there was a stack of, of tires that were ready for recycling from people changing out to their winter tires here lately. Um, there was a tire that fit very well and had a reasonable tread on it still. And so we got that changed out and balanced up. And meantime, we were listening to, there was a sound coming from the front, front, one of the front tires in their vehicle. And it had a hole in that. So got that off and got that patched. And, and uh, anyway, this um, couple, was, they were so deeply appreciative. We sent them on their way with some carrots and some apples and, and um, some, some reading materials that can be a blessing to them. So we just, you never know how God leads, how God guides. And we're glad we could share the blessings we've been blessed with and uh, pray that these are seeds planted. These people are living sort of homelessly in, in Vancouver. The lady said she lived in a motorhome. The guy, I think he lived in that van. Um, anyway, it, it was, uh, yeah, it, you never know who you have a chance to witness to and to share with. And we just pray that God will water those seeds that have been planted. Um, I have a prayer request for uh, my mom. She's been in Mexico visiting her sister, my aunt, and she was supposed to come back last week, but she's been delayed because of the, the weather of the hurricane coming through Florida. So she's supposed to, hopefully, if they don't cancel the flight again, um, get back on Monday. So um, praying that she gets back safely. And then prayers for my aunt, her sister. Um, she has uh, had some issues with her back, and uh, she needs a surgery. She's not been able to walk and has been in a lot of pain, and um, they can give her injections to, like, help with the pain, but uh, long-term, she needs the surgery. But in Mexico, like, my aunt doesn't have insurance, so in Mexico, you have to, like, pay for your surgery before they will do the surgery. So they're trying to get that together. Um, but I just pray that um, she would be able to have that soon and um, and that she would get some relief. Y'all will now kneel for the prayer song. Dear Lord, thank you so much that we can all be here this morning. Um, thank you that it's Sabbath. Thank you for carrying us through this week. 
and thank you for all the times you protected us, whether it was Mr. Halverson or um, Mr. Luchek when they were getting wood. Um, thank you for the divine appointment you made for Mr. Luchek last night with the um, people in the van. Thank you that he was at the right place at the right time and help that experience to impact them for life. Um, Lord, please be with um, the Olams as they're going to Thailand. Please protect them and help them to have a safe trip there and to do your work and further your cause. Please be with um, Mrs. Corsi's sister and or her aunt and her mother. Help her to have the surgery well and be with her mom as she's traveling. Um, Lord, please be with all the other prayer requests that were mentioned and thank you for all the praises. Thank you for always being there for us and for always holding our hand through whatever we are going through. Um, help us to trust you and to love you and to live our lives for you today. In your name, amen. Orchestra and choir.
all going to stand for it. Enjoy it. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in your house, Lord, today. On your sacred Sabbath day, we have come to learn your way. Holy day. Father God, thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for a day of rest that we can come together. We invite your Holy Spirit to be with us. If there's any evil influence here, we pray that you drive it out. And we pray that your angels be present and your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. It's a privilege to be here this morning. Um, I want to give a warm welcome, and to those in, in, that are meeting online, um, welcome and happy Sabbath. Um, I'm excited to be able to be here today to share with you uh, what God has been doing in our lives the past 14 years. Uh, as many of you know, my, my family and I serve with Adventist Frontier Missions in Cambodia uh, for the past 14 years, and I've been looking forward to an opportunity to share some pictures, share with you what God has been doing, and so um, before I start, um, if you would bow your heads with me for a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of sharing the things that you have done and the ways that you have used us. Please give me the words to say, speak through me, and may you receive all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so... I want to start off here with a just a quick overview of the project, what we've been doing, and then um, get into some ways that they were applicable to us from Scripture, and then leave you with a challenge. So getting started here, uh, you can see on the map, uh, there's a picture of Southeast Asia. You can find Cambodia there. It's, it is um, bordered by Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam. And then within Cambodia itself, you can see that our project is located up in the town of Sin Monarom. We're clear upon the eastern part of the country, right next to Vietnam. I believe we're about 17 kilometers from the border. And despite being that close, I never had the opportunity to cross over um, due to visa issues and things like that. So uh, maybe at some point we'll get over there, I'm not for sure. But um, so anyway, that's where. Uh, the project is located, and there's another AFM project that was located. You see the bend in the, in the river there, right below the, the sign where it says Mekong? Um, there's another AFM project there as well. Um, but just to give you a little feel for, for what things are like there, um, in Cambodia you have a rainy season and you have dry season. And for most of the country, it's six months on, six months off. Um, I was talking with a, with a guy up in our area, and in our area in particular, when he got there back in the late 80s and then into the 90s, it was three months of dry season and nine months rainy season. But when they started doing all the logging of the trees up there, it shifted the rainy season and the dry season, so it was six months and six months. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, just a, I got a lot of pictures here for you guys, so I hope, I hope you find some of these interesting. Uh, this is what the lowland, what um, a lot of Cambodia looks like. Uh, you have the, the rice fields, and you have the palm trees, and um, it's really, really beautiful, and it's really hot, hot and humid. And I praise God, that's one of the blessings that we experienced. We lived in Phnom Penh for about a year and a half, and when we were there, it was just like nonstop sweating. But God called us to Mundelkiri, and you can see here these pictures are from Mundelkiri. You're in the, in the highlands, if you would, and it's cooler temperatures. It'll still get up into the, into the up close to 90s, into the 100s um, on a really hot day, but it'll drop 15, 20 degrees in the evenings, and it cools off enough that it just makes life more bearable there. 
And so that was been a blessing. I thank God. I think almost every day we were there. Just thank you for the climate that was easier to adjust to. Um, just different views from the area. Those trees look really small because I took them from a mount from the top of a hill. But when you're around those trees, they can be they can be big, and they're really really tall. Uh, and this is one of the views I enjoy the most. With the, with the area, it's just, it's kind of bald on top of the mountains, if you would, at times. They have grass that's knee high, and in the, in the, the times when it's, um, it gets that tall, the wind is blowing, and it's just, I love watching the, the ripples, kind of like going through the wheat fields, if you would. And um, oftentimes there's jungles down in the valley, and a lot of different interesting animals live in the area. Um, before I get into the animals, the waterfalls. Um, when we were first there, uh, Kara went back to deliver Autumn. Andrew was about two years old at the time, so she took him, and it was Christmas time, and I was kind of sad that my family wasn't there, and Braden and Johanna invited us up to the project site to um, be there for Christmas, and it was so neat to be able to be around a waterfall, because everything was flat in the lowlands, but to be around a waterfall in the cool of the shade, it's just, just to bask in God's presence. It, it, it did me good. So getting into the animals, there's all sorts of little critters that run around here. Um, the chickens, uh, you have water buffalo. You got a, the, I grew up with a song, everybody's got a water buffalo. Um, but these guys, I, first I walked through the village and I would, didn't think a whole lot about them, but I was reading in the newspaper this week and a guy was gored to death by one of these guys. So you gotta, gotta give the bigger animals their, give them their space. Uh, but they're all over the place throughout the country. Does anybody know what this is? Dragon fruit, that's right. Um, this is one of the many varieties of fruit that they have there. And dragon fruit, at least in the area that we were in, they had the white, and the, the flesh is white, and there's also a, a dark red version. It's almost so dark it's purple. Um, so these are bananas. One of the things I found out very quickly was that bananas grow up. The clusters, the fingers grow up instead of down. For some reason, as a kid, I had my, the bananas is growing down. But uh, anyway, this is what we call mangosteen, and it's a very delicious fruit. And it's kind of controversial in some ways because when you go to a hotel, there's two fruits that they have signs out in front. They say, do not bring in durian and do not bring in mangosteen. And we found out very quickly that the mangosteen fruit, it tastes good, but if you get the, 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 the liquids or the juices on your clothes, they stain and turn into brown and they do not come out. So one of the reasons the hotels, they have nice white linens, they don't want um, the fruit staining. So. This is a centipede we had on our back porch, and um, full grown, they get about like this, and they pack a pretty serious punch. You don't want them biting you. This is another one of those critters that we found out at the farm. Um, they're kind of fun to get them agitated, get them worked up. They go into full defense mode, and their, their pinchers are out, and their tail's up, and so I always, guys, when they really want to challenge themselves, will go through and pick them up by their stinger and hold them. And um, it took me a long time before I could get to that point. And then finally, the, the best of all is the elephants. Every now and then in our area, you would come across an elephant, either in the village or occasionally you'd see them walking alongside the road. And so these guys, oftentimes they're moving them from one field to another. And um, it's always a, always a treat. Every, occasionally we got to ride them, but it was a, it was a real, treat to be able to see these guys. One of the things that I'm going to, you'll notice me saying in the, in the presentation today is, um, has to do with the, the, how do we address the, the, the people in the country. Uh, with our Penang friends, uh, they call, uh, a fa um, for example, they would call me in but Andrew. That means the father of Andrew. Um, my wife, they would call me Andrew. So if you call me, hear me calling somebody May Andrew or but Andrew or mate and but Andrew. Um, I'm talking about the father of, the mother of, or the parents of this person. So it's just one of the, the cultural things with, with the families there. So uh, let me see here. 
Before I get too much farther, I want to take a minute and say that God has been the driving force behind this project. I want him to get all the glory for everything that, that has taken place here. Um, without him, we simply wouldn't be here and the work done would not have happened. So I want to start off by giving God the glory for that. Um, there's three different aspects of the project. We have the village ministry, we have the school, and then we had the, the industries that supported the school. And so starting off here, I'm gonna go over the, the um, village ministry and share with you uh, kind of what that looked like. Um, when we started off, we were doing our language and culture acquisition, and we had some resources from Braden and Johanna, the first missionaries on the project. And thankfully, Kara had learned to read and write in Kamai whenever we were doing our Kamai language study when we first got in country. And so they were able to take the Kamai, make a few adjustments to it, and then she was able to read the, the Penang script. So they derived the Penang script from the Kamai. And so uh, we found ourselves using Braden and Johanna's books, and then as we're working with people, we started to find people that were interested in learning about God, and we would worship together with them, um, and started a, a Sabbath school uh, class that way in the village, and so there's one family that we started working with, we were introduced to from the very beginning, and uh, the lady's name is Jan T, and you've, I'm sure you've seen her in the Frontiers magazine before, I'll show you pictures later on here, but um, her and Kara got to be very close, and so um, as time grew on and we had other teammates come up, um, she had a family member that got sick and was in the hospital in town. They lived about an hour drive away in Puchiri Village. And so uh, Jan T called up our teammate Greg and said, hey, my family's in the hospital. They have worshiped the spirits their entire lives and the mother's sick and they can't get any better. Nothing's working. They've spent all of their money on resources to, to, and for animal sacrifices to appease the spirits. Nothing's working. They want to enter Christianity. Can you help them? And so Greg said, sure. So he went to the hospital with Jan T and they met the family and they explained the situation. And so they went out to, Greg took them back to their house. The, the wife was, um, Mate Kiev was discharged that, that morning. And so they started to have Bible studies with them. And one of the first things we did with the family was do the house cleansing. And in Penang culture, the house is protected by the spirits and so Whenever somebody takes that first decision to enter Christianity and to start learning about God, they have to make that separation and leave the spirits and the ancestor worship behind and start that walk anew with God and have him be the protector of the house. So it's not like they're getting baptized per se, but there's a definite line in the sand that's being drawn. So we were able to do that that first Sabbath with Maiten and Buck Kiep at their house. And... Um, so we went there and we took everything that was demonic, everything that was dealing with worshiping the ancestors out of the house, the rice wine jars, everything, we threw it in a pile and lit it up, as you can see here. And so um, as we started Bible studies with these guys, we realized that we would share a Bible study with them, but they didn't seem to retain any of the information. These guys are coming from zero Bible knowledge. So we had to start at the foundation and start building, building things up. Start with just a simple Bible stories. They didn't know about Adam and Eve and Noah and all the stories that we grew up learning. And so um, we, this is a picture of the, of the dedication of the house, but we started to, to um, teach them and train them and work with them. And after a while, they started to remember the stories. I forgot an important aspect. I'm going to step back here a little bit. When they do the house dedications, they go through and they put olive oil on the corner posts of the house, on the sides of the door frame, and on the lintel. And that is representative to them of the Holy Spirit being there. And so um, we, they know very clearly that there's no power in that olive oil but that it is symbolic of the Holy Spirit being there providing protection for the house. So after a year and a half of working with Maiten and Bukkiep, they were finally ready for baptism. And they started to share Christ with their neighbors, with their family members, and it's like their lives were totally transformed. 
and they started to invite people to come to church on Sabbath afternoon with us. And we started to notice that there was ladies that were coming in and they were having stomach issues, just like Mate Kiep had had when she was in the hospital that first time when, when Greg took her to the village. And we were able to help diagnose that, to get them the medications that they needed, meet their physical needs, and then they were more open and receptive to the, the gospel and the, what we had to share. This is a picture of Kara um, sharing with them. I gotta tell you, that was really challenging. You go through and you share a Bible study and you ask them questions and they really don't remember anything, much less a week before whenever you just, you ask questions about what we studied the week before and they didn't remember anything either. But by God's grace, they started to learn and um, it was excited to see the group grow. And um, this is a picture, um, but Kiep is in the white shirt, Mate Kiep is in the, the checkered shirt, and this is a group that was uh, getting, um, of their friends getting ready to be baptized from uh, the village there. <clears throat> now, um, and Buck Kiep is to the point where he's a uh, deacon in the church, and he's, he's viewed as a spiritual leader. So he's taking out and, and leading the, the activities of the church, and it's really exciting. The group from down in Puchiri is on fire, and this is the group as it was the, the last time we saw them, the last time we got to worship with them. Okay, so um, moving on to the school here. Um, back when we were doing our culture study, with, the, with um, doing our language learning and, and culture study for the Penang, we started to ask ourselves, how can we, what are the felt needs of the people? And we noticed education was lacking tremendously in the villages. So we started to ask God, do you want us to start a school? And before long, he starts opening the doors. Uh, we get approval for it. We're bringing it to committees and um, getting support from the local Cambodia Adventist mission and uh, from AFM. And so we dove, dove right into it. Uh, we had to find a piece of land to rent, or excuse me, to purchase. And this is the rental facility that we have, or that, that we started out with. Um, it was a large house and we just used the different, different bedrooms as classrooms. We ended up um, having 48 students the first year. We had kindergarten through second grade, and each year we grew with a grade as we were able to. And um, it was exciting getting to see God work. There was a lot of miracles that were performed. Uh, if you look carefully, you'll be able to see my kids in there. Um, and the different pictures as we're showing here, they were, they were quite little at the time. And Right about the, let me see here. This is one of our first student missionaries, uh, Maraika. She came to us from South Africa and had the opportunity to teach English to the students there, as well as um, by the time that I was coming, getting sick, having to go back to the stateside for, for my chemo treatments, uh, she was able to fill in as the principal of the school. So I was very thankful that she was there and able to help out in those, the variety of capacities um, this is our first year's students and our teachers. Um, very, very humble beginnings. This, they're drilling a well on the school property. It was just covered with undergrowth, just, just brush there. And so we went through and cut everything out. And this is what it looked like whenever I went back stateside for my um, chemo treatments. One of the ways that we were blessed is um, funds were raised and we were able to get a machine and the equipment to make our own block for building the school. They had Cambodian brick, but we were looking for something a little bit more substantial. And so there's an outfit down in Texas called Dwell Earth and they had made an interlocking compressed earth block machine. And so we'd take the dirt that we had on hand, mix it with about eight to 10% cement, add a little bit of sand and water, and we were able to start cranking out blocks. And um, pretty neat process. And that, um, this is what the school looked like from the inside uh, with all the block on the walls. Um, we had two blanks of classrooms with a gymnasium in the middle. And it was very similar, if you're familiar with Maranatha's EC3 building, um, this was loosely built off of that. So. Um, we had several mission trips come over. We had a, had a group come in from Canada here, as well as from uh, Monterey Bay Academy, came over and helped us with, um, with building this. 
in conjunction with the local construction team. And um, by God's grace, we had the school building completed. Um, it, was, it was absolutely amazing. It was 75% completed by the time we got back um, and were on the ground and able to get up and going again. Uh, altogether, this building is about a 20,000 square foot facility and it is literally a light on the hill. Uh, you could see it from, from town and um, everybody in town knows about the school. So um, just a couple of other things here. Uh, this is what the inside of it looks like um, with our upper graders. They're um, learning computers. And before we returned, I was so thankful God worked it out so that our staff housing, we had two units. We had this one, this complex, and then um, we had the other one here that were able to be completed. And I was very thankful that God's, God's timing is perfect. And um, so it was a blessing to be able to see those things uh, be finished up. One of the things that we wanted to do with the school outside of evangelistic activities was to be able to um, have it be self-supporting. And so we started an industries and a work-study program with that um, so that we, we were able to purchase a farm, some land, and use it as a farm. And we also had a bakery in town and um, produced excellent bread. And it was a real blessing to be able to have that to service the community in that way. The students were able to learn how to uh, bake bread as part of their classes. And with the work study program, we had scholarships. We found out it worked best that the scholarship students were able to help out on the farm. And so uh, once a week, they would be able to go out and work on that. Uh, the rest of the, the other two days out of the week that they were working uh, behind the staff housing units here, we had a small, small plot of ground that we were working with, with um, growing different vegetables and produce and things like that. This is the students working on the farm. It was really nice because we had about two hectares of land cleared out of 21. We had mountainous area, and one hectare of that was planted with uh, durian trees that you see here, and there's another hectare that was planted with avocado. So um, in the next several years, they should be getting, um, coming up probably another three years, the durian should be ready for harvest, uh, start producing their first fruits and the avocados should be coming on a little bit, a little bit sooner than that. And about like everything that you do over there, you gotta start from the ground up. And the first time we got out to the property, uh, we couldn't even drive a truck out there. We had to park a couple kilometers away and walk the rest of the way in. And um, travel in Mundelkitty, especially during the rainy season, can be very difficult. So we were able to secure, um, work together with the company, get the necessary permits, and get the road opened up. So we were able to go through with these guys with the excavator and dozer and get a full six meter road through with drainage ditches on the sides and a few um, culverts put in as need be. And um, yeah, get the work done. So that, that kind of makes up the, the project. And I've had some people ask me, what does is, what is your day look like? What does it look like in the life of a missionary? And through the 14 years that we were there, it was continually shifting. We'd go through phases. And before we started anything up there, we had to learn how to ride this thing. And I didn't have a whole lot of experience riding motorcycles prior to this. And it was a real, um, it was pretty fun to me because this wasn't the, the new automatic start kind. It was the old kickstart kind. Like the, this is a Honda, they called it a Super Cub 90. And so um, very simple engine. A lot of fun to drive. Um, this is Boothru Village, and it's where I started doing my Penang language study. Real small little village, but it can be really difficult to get to. This is what the road looked like, one portion of it in rainy season. And just to explain a little bit, the, the, um, the roads are made out of hard packed clay, and you get the rain comes through and it washes it out, so it erodes it. And after weeks and weeks and months of rain coming down, mold starts to grow on that. So it's hard packed, you get this mold which makes it slick, very similar to driving a motorcycle on ice without any studs. And so you can see the people at the top here had laid their bike over. Um, we laid our bikes over many times, but you just, you get to the point where before you leave the house, you pray and ask God to protect you. 
and help you to get there safely. And I'm, I'm very thankful that God watched over us in our, in our years there because travel in country, and especially up here, was, was very difficult. Um, so there's, there's many different things that we do. Um, we would, one of the things we did initially with the Penang was to put together a cultural scrapbook. And so we took all the information we could learn about them, put it together so that we could better understand how they think, how they work, and how we could present the gospel to them uh, in an appropriate manner. Um, we would also follow people. We would, we would, in order to do the scrapbook, we would spend two or three days at a time watching people, seeing how they work. And we were taking a break here in this picture. Kara's given an injection to uh, Rota, and he, was, um, he needed an injection for something, so she was giving it. Um, this thing, I'm clicking too hard. Uh, this is a friend of mine, we call him in Butt Whoop, and he was, showed me how to make knives out there. And making knives was something I enjoyed uh, being able to do. It was uh, really fun to be able to watch the guys. The people in, in the village here, almost everybody knew was a blacksmith. They knew how to swing a hammer, make their own hose, make their own knives, whether small ones or the bush knives. And it was just fun getting to, to be able to watch them work. Um, this is one of my one of my favorite pictures, one I, one I enjoy, because it, but Whoop is there working with the metal in the fire. Um, they're using old leaf springs for their, for their metals. And they oftentimes, were, whereas a blacksmith here in the States will have, an, or in, in, the, in the West here, they'll have, a, have an anvil to work off of. Their anvil was simply a maul head, the head from a maul that was laid in the ground, and that's what they would hammer on. Um, but you notice the, the bellows that they have here. It's made out of two pipes two aluminum pipes, and I asked them the story on it, and apparently there was, back in the war, I'm not for sure if it was during the Vietnam War or during um, Pol Pot's time, but there was an airplane, airplanes flying overhead. One of them was shot down, landed, or crashed in the jungle, and they were able to salvage these pipes off of that, and they put together two sticks with a round disc on the end that had feathers around it, like chicken feathers, and they used that. It would close off it, and it would, it would work as a bellows. There was a rhythm. They would just kind of work with, with that rhythm when, they're, when they're, they're pumping the bellows on that fire. So anyway, something, something I really enjoyed there was watching them be able to do that. Um, this is Janty and Kara um, working on getting some pumpkins cut up and ready for, for dessert. Um, one of the first days that Kara took, spent with her learning the Penang language, um, but Chal was sick. And Brayden told Kara the situation, said, hey, would you be willing to go out there with me? We need to take him into the hospital. So they drove the, uh, what was it, 11 kilometers out there and picked him up. And I remember helping carry him out of the backseat of Brayden's old Toyota Hilux. We, we picked him up and laid him on this, this, this platform. He went into the hospital, and Kara was able to, to learn, the, learn the, the, the language, the medical terminology that day. But by the end of the day, he was dead. He had died of cirrhosis of the liver. He had drank him, his self to liver failure. And it's a very common uh, occurrence there with people. It's they're, they're worshiping the spirits. They're drinking the rice wine. And it, it carries over to the um, just drinking for fun as well. And so at the end of the day, they had to carry his body out to the village. The family was able to prepare that for burial. And the next day, um, that was language learning one-on-one, -on -one, was um, about funerals and how they, how they um, care for their dead. And in the, the adult Sabbath school class, they were talking about the spirits of the dead being um, around them in Bible times. And um, that was the belief at the time, and it's a very similar belief here. And so language study and life of a missionary is, it can, it can be all over the place. Um, this is Kara at the end of our um, school year. At the back of the property, we put together a whole bunch of tarps stacked on each other, make a long chute for a slip and slide. And after the award ceremony, we turn the water pump on and start pumping down here and, and get, get a couple bottles of dish soap. And the students just have a blast sliding down the hill. And um, this, is, this is an example of me on my first 
one of my first days of language study, I was out with a maintenance book cat, and you got to ask about everything. What's this? What's this? What's this? And it, it, it's um, kind of a grueling process, but most folks are willing to work with you and uh, share a little bit. You kind of, you got to spread yourself amongst the community and so you don't, um, don't you make sure you're not too much of a burden. Uh, this day I was able to help take students from the school back to their house and um, I think we maybe had 10 or more students in our little truck. It's probably about the same size as James's little uh, truck he's got out back here. Um, but you just pack them in all over the place and, and away you go. There's also, um, as we progress in the project with the construction, I was over, able to oversee that, um, making repairs to equipment, managing the farm, uh, preaching on the weekends, doing sermons, and, and different, different aspects like that that just, that just come as part of it. Donor ministry, um, calling people, saying thank you, and spending time with the family. So we tried to encourage the kids to be as much a part of the project as we could, and um, it was a blessing to have them there. Uh, this is an example of one of the rice wine jars, very old jars, and um, these are these are some gongs that they have there. They are, um, I, I don't know how old these things are. Nobody there knows. They've just been around for generations. And they use these, they'll set them up from the smallest gong all the way to the largest gong, and people will play them, and they, they pound out a rhythm with their hands as they're doing that. And again, it's tied to spirit worship. And it's, um, it's something that is, it's been a privilege to be able to share Christ with people and see them step away from that. Um, this is how the Sabbath school classes got started out there, was by Kara and Janti working together and meeting together. We met our families together and then it grew from there. <clears throat> Okay, so I want to step back here for a minute and transition out of the project per se and into some of the things that I, I found in scripture at that, um, that I thought were kind of, kind of interesting, just wanted to share it with you guys. Um, so you guys remember the story of the, the Samaritan woman and Jesus at the well, right? Um, Jesus and his disciples were, were going from Judea in the southern part and they had to cross up through Samaria to get up to Galilee for their next destination. And they, had, they were at the well that Jacob had dug. It was about noontime. And um, the disciples had gone into town to get some food for their meal. And the Samaritan woman comes out, and she's getting water at the well. And Jesus knew where she was coming from. He started to engage her in conversation. And he was wooing her to him as only the Messiah could. And the disciples come back about this time, and they're like, Lord, what are you doing talking with this Samaritan woman? You're not even supposed to be, you're not supposed to be doing that. And um, after a while, she leaves. And the disciples ask Jesus if he wants to eat something. And he says, I have food to eat of which you do not know. And at that point is where I want to pick up the, the reading in, this, in the scripture. John 4, verses 35 through 38. It says, do you not know that there are still four months, and then come the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored, Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. So the Bible commentaries is, shares with us that in Palestine, the grain for, is sown in the autumn, and then it is ready for reaping in the spring, around April, May air time. And so Jesus, this was probably uh, December or January when they were meeting, and the disciples could see the villagers coming back, working their way through the grain fields with this woman. And this is when he's speaking to them. So you kind of get this picture that Jesus is speaking, the harvest is white and ready for reaping, and you see the people walking through here. And Jesus, um, it says here, the seeds of truth were sown in the heart of that woman, um, and they'd already beginning to bear fruit 
and in the next couple of days, it were bearing much fruit. And so um, I got to thinking about the harvest. And how many people does it take to harvest a field? Is it just one person, one family? I think I've just got finished watching the carrot harvest out here. And it takes a whole group of dedicated people to get those carrots in, doesn't it? You got the people behind the, behind the harvester picking up the carrots. They're not playing games on their phone. They're not looking around at airplanes flying by overhead. They're focused on the ground, gathering up the carrots. Um, the guy in the tractor driving the harvester, he's not just driving wherever he wants to. He's followed, making sure that point is in the ground at the right depth and making sure it's, it's getting as many of those carrots out as possible. You got the guy in the tractor pulling the trailer. He can't go too fast, he can't go too slow, and he's gotta make sure he's positioned that trailer right over that, that um, for, back of letter, for lack of a better word, that auger is dumping those carrots into the back of that trailer. Um, and we had a similar situation. It took a group of dedicated individuals for the work to move forward over there. Sure, our family was on the ground, we were at the forefront of it, but we had a dedicated support team that was backing us up. We had folks at the office that were providing logistical support for us. Um, we had prayer warriors and our supporters that were helping out on a financial basis um, and prayer support for the project. Um, our field directors were our advocates between us and the home office to make sure information was transferred clearly. And we also had colleagues on the ground. So it was a group effort. It wasn't just like our family was the, the one doing it. Um, it reminded me, stepping back here, um, about 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. It says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So I've noticed that there's oftentimes multi-generational multi growth on a project. It's not just one missionary family that does it all. It started off with the Pewitt family back in early 2000. Um, when they transitioned out, we were there. Um, and then the Nicolades and the Timmons family came. And now there's the, Tim the Tennysons are the team leaders, along with the Hadas, the student missionaries, and the Nicolades who are still there on the project. So. It takes a, takes a group effort in order to get things um, completed. God needs dedicated workers who will listen to his voice, for his voice, and do what he wants them to do. As I was getting around here, I found a, a, um, a letter, letter to a doctor, and I thought it was very applicable. Sorry. I thought it was very applicable to our situation, both on the project as well as today. It says, the Lord has made you a man of his appointment, and angels of God have been your helpers. The Lord has placed you in the position that you occupy, not because you are infallible, but because he desires to guide your mind by his Holy Spirit. He desires you to impart to those with whom you come in contact a knowledge of present truth. Grave responsibilities have been entrusted to you, and on no account should you allow yourself to be entangled in work that will weaken your influence with Seventh-day Adventists. The Lord has chosen you to fill a place of his appointment and to stand before the medical profession, not to be molded by worldly influences, but to mold minds. Every day, you are to be under the supervision of God. He is your master, your redeemer. He has a work for you to do, not separated from Seventh-day Adventists, but united with them. You are to be a great blessing to your brethren by giving them the knowledge that he has given you. I don't know what the doctor's position or where he was at in life at the point where this was, this was written, but it's, it's clear that God had a plan in mind for the doctor. He wanted him to stand firm for the truth, and he wanted him not to be molded by the world, but to mold others for the kingdom. He needed the doctor despite his deficiencies, to stand firm on his watch and to listen and act on what the Holy Spirit was asking him to do. I was looking back on the verse there in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, 
and I found in the Bible commentary is referring to the labor, laboring together with God. He said the Greek, in the Greek language, it puts the emphasis on God. The work is God's. Men are merely the hands of the heavenly agencies. A vision of the exalted nature of being co-workers, not with the great men of this world, but with the creator of this world, the one by whom power, the, by whose power the universe is maintained, makes the highest honors and greatest rewards the world can offer seem insignificant. If all would catch this vision of their exalted privilege and act unitedly for the carrying out of God's plans, they would move the world. If we realize that we have the privilege of serving with God and do as he asks us to do, we're going to be able to move the world, change the world. So as our song leaders are preparing to come up, I want to encourage you in a couple ways here. Our time on this earth is short. James 4.14 says, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. I want to encourage you to stand, for, stand firm for the gospel truth. Stand firm during your watch, during your time on this earth. Listen for your orders from the Holy Spirit and then do what you're called to do, no matter the cost. Do you want to do amazing things for God? Do you want to partner together with him in the final moments of this earth's history? If you do, then I would encourage you to please stand for their closing hymn. It's hymn number 196, Tell Me the Old, Old Story.
Heavenly Father, as we depart today, we pray that you would help give us strength, give us courage. Our time here is short. Wherever we serve, help us to stand firm for you and um, be able to share with others your love. We thank you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.